Hey, everybody. We, um, hi. Tonight we're here one on one with Grant Faulkner. And hey. Ruth is not here behind the scenes with me tonight. So be patient if I miss a question or something like that. We'll try to catch everything. A um, little housekeeping before I introduce Grant and we get into our combo. Down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat. And just you can just pop that open. You guys can chat amongst yourselves over there. But if you have a question that you want me to pose to Grant, just put that over, see down at the bottom, you'll see a Q&A with two bubbles, pop that open, and then you can put there, welcome, welcome everyone. I'm yeah. very excited to talk to Grant. Grant and I met on Twitter. Do we meet on Twitter or do we meet at a I think so. Time? I think we met on Twitter and then we met at the Writer's Digest conference. Yeah. Yes. Twitter is a great place. Um, really? <laughs> no. It's it's a it's a great place. Um, it used to be a great place. It sometimes is a great place. It can be a great place. Yeah, it can be. All social media can be a great place. Yeah. But okay, before we go, I'm going to introduce Grant. Do a formal oh. introduction. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Grant is the executive director of National Novel Writing Month, and I'm going to be kind of doing that this year, but in my own little way. And we'll all um, we'll have to find a way to connect with each other if any of you guys are are doing it, so that we can all follow each other and cheer each other on. Um, but he's also the co-founder of a hundred word story. He's published Pep Talks for Writers, 52 Insights and Actions to Boost Your Creative Mojo, Brave the Page, All the Comfort Sin Can Provide, Fissures, a collection of a hundred word stories and nothing short of a hundred, selected tales from a hundred word story. His stories have appeared in dozens of literary magazines, including Tin House, the, Southern, the Southwest Review, and the Gettysburg Review, as well as in anthologies such as Best Small Fictions and Norton's New Micro, exceptionally short fiction. His essays on creativity have been published in the New York Times. Ooh, the New York Times. I want to hear about that. Poets and Writers, Writer's Digest, and The Writer. Um, and you can also write for write, Pipeline Artists anytime you want. <laughs> sure. Um, he also hosts Write Minded, a weekly podcast on writing and publishing, and he's an executive producer of the oh, upcoming TV show, America's Next Great Author. Oh my God. I, I don't know whether you. Where do we begin? Um, okay. Uh, just a little, since it was right in your bio, what is a hundred word story? Yeah, it's a story that is exactly 100 words, not exactly. a word not one word more or one word less. Um, so it's, I, I think of it as like a, a camera with a with a fixed lens, you know, like you can't zoom in or anything. And so if that's the challenge. You're writing within this constraint. And so my, my theory uh, is that yeah. constraints bring out your creativity. Uh, usually constraints have like a negative connotation, but I think it's positive actually. Mm -hmm. and, and the 100 word story, like I started doing 100 word stories very accidentally way back when I was working on this novel, I call my doomed novel. I've been working on it for years. And a friend of mine published a collection of 100 word stories and I became very charmed by them. And I initially tried to write some of them, but I would only be able to write like 150 words. That's as short mm. as I could get it. Mm. And, I, and I told him, I said, hey, I'm very proud of myself. I've been writing these short stories just like you and they're about 150 words. And he was like, no, 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 no. You got to get them down to 100. You have to practice that exercise of omission and telling a story through hints and, you know, like um, thinking about the power of suggestion in your prose. Mm -hmm. And so it really did make it formed this whole new writing mindset for me and taught me a lot about creating suspense on the page and what you don't need to include, like uh, writing a hundred word story it's almost like you're, it's a collaborative writing reading experience. Your reader is filling in so many of the gaps. So you're writing with gaps as well as like the words. So it's just a very different writing experience than writing yeah. novels. Although they've really informed each other for me. My writing short has really informed the way that I write long. I think that's really interesting too. Like I, I know when we were talking about Twitter before, one of the things I loved about the 140 character Twitter Mm -hmm. is it was such a great exercise in editing yeah and exactly really, and when they made it 200 and is it 240 now 
I think 250, like, yeah. Yeah, it's like really, like, really, can, can we go back to the other way? Because you can say the same thing in less words and then it's, it's less, I don't know, I, th I just think it's helpful for writers. I think it's really a great tool to learn how to do that. Absolutely. And that's what 100 word story is for me. It's an exercise more in editing than writing. Yeah, it, it really teaches you. And, and it's amazing because you've just noticed because you're paying attention to every single word. So mm -hmm. you're just noticing every flabby part of a sentence. Mm -hmm. Every word has to do a lot of work. And even when I pick up my 100 word stories, some of them that have been published every once in a while, I'll be like, oh, wow, this needs editing. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can still tighten this more. Yeah. You're, and you're writing so much just for the pure essence of a moment, you know, so it kind of changes. But this is all to say, too, that, you know, like uh, 100 word stories, I always get asked, can you really tell a story in 100 words? And yeah. My answer is you can, because most of the stories I, I've, I've read or that we've either published on the website or I've published, they have a beginning, middle, and end. They have mm -hmm. a character change or pivot. It's a little bit different maybe, uh, but, but it's there. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, and Alexandra said, I try to fit what I want to say um, on the Twitter limit. <laughs> which, is, which is good. It's just a good tool. And, and if there's any screenwriters um, listening to us, um, Twitter is a really good, and this hundred word story is probably a really good exercise in helping you get a lot of weight on the page, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so let's go back to when you were a child. <laughs> is, this a, is this a therapy session? Yes. Open like, therapy relax. Session. <laughs> it's okay. a therapy session with wine. <laughs> wow. wow, that's a big yeah. bug of wine. Well, it's not full. Um, it was. Okay, so like when... I saw something on your website about like writing supplies mm. is one of like, when you were a kid was like your favorite thing, like back to school and going. Oh to get gosh. Them. Yeah. That was second to Christmas. <laughs> and like, I wonder why that is like, I loved that. Yeah. Those I, I don't know. I mean, I think sometimes there's a genetic component uh, to these things. I mean, I just was born loving writing supplies. Mm -hmm. I would, I would, uh, when my mom lost me in the grocery store, I'd always, I'd always be sitting there in the tiny section with the notebooks and notepads and pens. And I just always had a, before I could write, I had a fascination with them, like on every single level, you know, it was kind yeah. of like a, a fetish, you know, I just, I just loved them. Um, and always liked to express myself that way. And, uh, you know, um, yeah. So from the start, I knew I was a writer. Do you believe in reincarnation? Because maybe... Maybe you were a writer in a past life, and that's what drew you. Are we getting? Oh, no, because being a writer. I've not had like, any wine yet. Yeah, no, being a writer is such a hard life. You'd never do it twice. <laughs> I'm joking. I, I take a lot of joy in being a writer. So yeah, maybe I I am reincarnated. So would you like? So say your child wants to be a writer. Would you encourage? I would. Uh, neither of my children have any any desire to be a writer. I think they, my wife is a writer, and I think they've just seen us. They, they see that there's no glamour to it. They see us sitting around with our laptops <laughs> on our laps writing, and they, they don't see the inner joy that we might be feeling. They see only kind of the, the anguish and the, um, you know, it's a challenge, right? I mean, being a writer is a challenge in terms of like every at every stage. It's a challenge to write your first draft. It's a challenge to go through all those revisions. It's a challenge to put it out there in the world and be so vulnerable and to receive feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, challenge to find an agent, to find a publisher. You know, there's a lot, of, like I say, there's a lot of joy in each step. And I'm obviously doing it for that joy. Um, yeah. But yeah, my kids, I think they see it. They just don't see the, the, the romantic glamour that a lot of people who don't grow up with writers as parents might see, you know? Like when I was growing up, I didn't know any writers. I grew up in this small town in Iowa. And so the images of writers were always wearing these beautiful sweaters and walking along <laughs> pastoral paths with dogs and pipes and great glasses of wine or whatever and living in France and it looked like a pretty good life. Yeah. Yeah. In theory, it does. It's it like, a, and I mean, how many times do you run across people who are like, oh, you're a writer? Like, do you do, have you written anything I would know? Like, or have you, like, you know, all that stuff. And they don't realize that there's so many ways to be a writer. I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we should talk about that. Like, a lot of people just assume if you're a writer, you've written a novel or you've written, I mean, but there's, you know, 
journalists and and there's also writing articles for sites writing short stories writing things that people may not always see right and the challenge of of that like what what being a writer means and like when people like for me i can't stand the word aspiring yeah i always say i mean the definition of writing to me you're a writer if you write mm -hmm. you know i mean i mean we're, we're we're all aspiring in the sense that this is part of the the anguish but also the magic and the joy of writing is that you you're, you've never mastered it you know you've yeah. never perfected it you know you're always going out every story has new challenges every sentence does and um and that's the beauty of it right is that we sit down and we try to perfect it we try to master it and so in that sense we're aspiring um but 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 i i really think that there's something i mean when i i, I like to joke about the anguish side like like that my kids see the non-romantic side but i'm happiest when i write actually mm -hmm. and i think there is just a joy of 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 finding meaning in the world and putting words to that meaning and putting it on the page. And then I love touching readers. I love, I don't mm -hmm. need to be a bestseller. I, I just need like essentially one reader. I just like, I'm so touched if somebody reads something I wrote and uh, tells me like, like what they thought. I think that that's a, like a magical moment. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So the, per your, per your, your theory, I just think there's so many ways to go about being a writer and uh, oftentimes people do make the assumption that everybody wants to be a best-selling author and make a lot of money and make, you know, movies off their books and all that stuff. And, and yeah, you know, uh, most writers probably do have that somewhere in the back of their mind. But one thing that I'm charmed by uh, that I really discovered more through um, my being executive director of National Novel Writing Month is a lot of people write with us every year just for the act of writing, just because they mm -hmm. like writing down stories and they like doing it with their friends. And I think that's, that's so special to have, you know, because that's what we do as children, right? Mm -hmm. Think about those first stories you wrote. You don't really think about publishing those and making money off of them and turning them into products. You're, you're just writing for the joy of storytelling. And uh, I think we all need to remember that joy, um, no matter where we are in, in, in our writer's writing life. Yeah. I mean, I, when, I just moved. And so when I moved, I went through everything and I happened to find uh, like a spiral notebook full of my high school angst poems mm. <laughs> which i told sadie I'll, i threatened to read one of them on reckless creators podcast <laughs> but yeah i mean it's fun to to just sort of see the evolution within yourself but also with those people you build a community with mm -hmm. you know like with nano um it's such a like how did you get involved with them uh accidentally I think everything, so much about NaNoWriMo is an accident, like a good accident. I think mm. we need to like look for accidents, trust accidents, yeah. have, have an intuitive sense about them. Like I actually, like, so Chris Beatty, actually, so I'll go back to the beginning of NaNoWriMo. In yeah. the, it, it was founded in 1999 by Chris Beatty, although he didn't found anything. He just wanted to write a novel with his friends. That's the accident part. Then it turned mm -hmm. into NaNoWriMo. But anyway, so he joined 20 of his friends to write a novel in, in 1999. I think uh, my good friend, Jake, um, wrote with Chris either in the year 2000 or 2001. But anyway, I was recently probably eight years out from getting my MFA at that point. Mm -hmm. And when I heard my friend Jake say, oh, we're all writing a novel in a month. I was like, that's not the right way to write a novel. That's like, that's, I was like, whatever. I was very, um, I guess, skeptical. Judg judgmental, skeptical. Yeah. And then uh, years later, um, you know, I kind of felt like my creative process was in a rut. And I had this question, I was like, do we determine our creative process or does it kind of just find us and we do it, you know? So I really wanted to question it. And I wrote in a kind of what I call precious, ponderous, slow style. And so I decided like, let's see what it's like to write something fast, you know, to, mm -hmm. to write with abandon. And I did NaNoWriMo and I thought it was such an interesting creative experiment. Um, yeah. And it led me down many creative paths that I wouldn't have gone down ordinarily. Uh, but then the way I got involved was actually totally different. Um, I was working for the National Writing Project, um, which is a nonprofit dedicated to helping teachers teach writing better. And mm -hmm. I'd been there for a number of years, and I wanted to deepen my nonprofit um, kind of management and leadership experience. And I just, Chris Beatty was an acquaintance. And I just sent him an email one day, and I was like, hey, do you know of any boards uh, in the East Bay uh, arts organizations that need board members. And he was like, mm -hmm. hey, why don't we talk? And I had no idea that he would uh, want to talk to me about joining his board. 
And mm. when I joined the board, he said, by the way, I'm stepping down and invited, <laughs> so thought I should apply. And I had no intention of being a nonprofit executive director, but he yeah. was a very persuasive guy and he convinced me to apply. I got the job and that was about 10 years ago. So, wow. yeah. Well, so, you're, yeah. Very, you're very good at it and um, <laughs> very warm and welcoming and helpful for writers. You know, it's that has to bring you a lot of satisfaction. Thank you. You know, it does. I mean, I feel like uh, I, I, I encounter so many people who say I'm not a creative type or I'm not a writer or I'm not a storyteller. And, and so I think like for me, um, NaNoWriMo exists to help enliven um, that, that creative energy and help people believe in themselves as creators mm -hmm. and storytellers. And so um, I would say, you know, there's that Picasso quote, which I'm probably going to mangle that every child is born an artist, but the challenge is to, to remain an artist once you're an adult. And what obviously happens is we got caught up so much in the ambitions, the aspirations of life, all the practical things in life mm -hmm. that most people let creativity slide off of their to-do lists. And so NaNoWriMo is like just one month of the year, 30 days where you get to say, I'm a creator, I'm a storyteller, I'm going to make it a priority for a month. And that's what I think its beauty is. And so hopefully you can keep it on your to-do list. Uh, maybe it's not number one the rest of the year, but somewhere, you know, because it's a really valuable thing to feel yourself as a creative type. We are, we're, we're all creative types. That's the definition of being human. So I don't take it when people say I'm not a creative type, mm. I, I hate hearing that. And um, yeah, so that's, that's. It, and, and I love that because, you know, it, it's like you're giving people permission to be artistic and creative and, and get their story on the page for one month out of the year. When a lot of times I think like when you talk about the kid thing, like when, you know, you're born an artist and you, the most beautiful thing is watching your children be uninhibited, like to not think about anything. They're, they have no boundaries or emotion. They're not embarrassed by anything. And then that moment, that first moment when you notice your child is like a little self-conscious. Mm -hmm. Like I will never forget that moment when I saw it on my daughter's face and it just was like, oh, it hurt, <laughs> you know, because the yeah. world come in and you knew that at that point, when you're self-conscious and you start double thinking and triple thinking and running it through your head before it comes out your mouth or, or for writers, before you put it on the page, yeah. if you're filtering yourself, it's going to change the work. I mean, that's one of the things like when I first read Stephen King's on writing and he had that section about write with the door closed. Don't think about anyone reading your work. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to, Matt about, you know, at Pipeline about like, what makes a really good story? What makes one of those great scripts or those, or the books that we, you know, judge for book pipeline, what makes it stand out? And he, it's always a good concept and writing with passion. Like, mm -hmm, you, know, they, you know, they really love what they're writing about and it shows on the page and and where they go to those places that you never expected but if you're filtering yourself and self-conscious and whatnot it's not going to happen and that for me is the beauty of nano because if mm -hmm. you're focusing on the goal of 100 what is it 1666 words whatever words a day 1500 words a day yeah i feel like the the beauty is you're focusing on the goal so you're not so much thinking about what I'm writing always you're you're getting the words out so you're it's more of a stream of consciousness and you're you're just putting it all I don't want to say vomiting but you know like all on the page and then you can look at it afterwards and you might be like okay there's a lot of this that's crap and I'm not going to use and this is what rewriting is for but I don't think I ever would have thought of this yeah you know, this Those plot point this character those are the gems I found that first year that I did it was it was a mm -hmm. creative process that led me to new places. And I think you, when you said that Matt, the best writing is writing that shows passion. I absolutely mm -hmm. agree. I think that the more a writer can be vulnerable on the page, that's that, you know, we connect to people who make themselves vulnerable. We connect yeah. to writing that makes them, you know, on the page that is vulnerable. I think that that's more important than any craft lesson actually is mm -hmm. to find that honesty and to, to, to let yourself be open. And, and so NaNoWriMo, you know, there's, in some ways, there's two basic principles. It's like banish your inner critic, 
all those naysaying voices and write with abandon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the goal and the deadline, which we say as a creative midwife, it puts that pressure and opens up that do those doors for you, right? Because like mm -hmm. you said, you have to focus on your progress on moving the story forward to get mm -hmm. that 1700 words a day. And that's where the writing with abandon comes in. But to write with abandon, you've got to have the critic, you know, out of the picture. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting formula for creativity. Um, so, yeah. So what have you found about like, okay, so like doing nano when people come to you and like, because Nano, if you go, if you guys go to the Nano Ramo website, nanoramo.org, um, there they've got resources. You know, they have T-shirts, <laughs> they have everything. But um, everybody needs a T-shirt to write a novel. By the way, that is a requirement. You have to. You do, you know, and you, you, uh, yeah, and you a mug. Also, that's right. <laughs> and oh, I should have worn my Pipeline artist sweatshirt. We have sweatshirts, by the way. But yeah. um, it it. People get hung up on what do I need to do to prepare for nano? And some people, I know I've talked to some writers who are like, well, I didn't do any preparing. I don't have an outline, so I can't do it. I would, I personally have done it a um, couple different ways. One was, okay, when you talked about trying on a different kind of writing style, writing strategy or routine or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a planner, so I'm very organized and I have outlines and I like my outline. Mm -hmm. But the first time I did Nano, I did not have any outline for the story. I had a story idea. And I said, you know what? I, I hear about these pantser people. <laughs> what is it like to be a pantser? And so that's what I did for my first mm, Nano. Good for you. And I, and I ended up with 50,000 words of crap in terms of prose and quality of prose and all that stuff. But it wasn't about that. It was about discovery of the story. Mm -hmm. And it went in, I never ended up finishing that novel and going back and writing it, but it it was more of an experiment. And, right. and it was supposed to be a product. And I wanted to see like, does this story have legs? Like, is this something, can I, is there enough conflict here? Can I, can I develop these characters enough? Are they interesting enough? And they took me places I never thought they would go. Mm -hmm. And they became these people. I never thought that they would do some of the things they did. <laughs> and it was so liberating that now my writing style is just a, a, a rough outline, a general idea of where I'm going to go. But I think in each, each chapter, what what do I want to happen in this chapter today? Like I might have a general idea, but there's all, when you do an outline, there's always missing chapters in your outline. You don't have every chapter figured out. I hope out. so. Yeah. Right. And so now I, the beauty of having done Nano the first time is now I'm sort of a mix of both. You know, I outline. You're a planter. You're a planter. I'm, a, I'm a planter. I yeah. kill, but I'm a planter. <laughs> You're a planter. Yeah. I liked it. several things you said there. One um, was that the draft is a, is a, is a process of, of, of discovery. And mm -hmm. I incre increasingly like to think of that first draft or rough draft. For me, I call it the discovery draft, the mm -hmm. exploratory draft. And I think that that's just a, a really, for me, a great way to view it because that's, and it could be a planning draft too. You know, a lot of people, I just talked to somebody on my podcast today, Andrea Bartz, who writes thrillers, but she doesn't outline the thriller ahead of time. She writes an exploratory draft in NaNoWriMo. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then she outlines afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I liked about what you said was that when you did that first nano, you were just testing an idea. Mm -hmm. And and I always say, what a, what a, a effective way to test an idea, to do mm -hmm. just spend 30 days with it. And for me, I do that too. And and part of the test is like, do I love this novel enough mm -hmm. to, to keep writing it? Because to, to write a novel and finish a novel, it can sometimes take years. Yeah. And so, part, you know, I want to assess the idea. It's a good idea, but I also want to assess my own passion uh, for writing it and my own, because, you know, part of that discovery draft, I would say it's, it's best to write for the question or to write for the answers to the questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm like you, I'm a planter and I don't want to diminish anyone's creative process because I think I know, I know outliners who write these big behemoth outlines and they are also joyful as they're writing their NaNoWriMo draft. Mm -hmm. But for me, outlines if i if they get to be too meticulous and too voluminous they they kind of corner me i feel mm -hmm. like i've already determined the story before i write the story and i want to write you know for those surprises that you mentioned 
Um, so I think it's like, and, and like you, I think like that's the, the beauty of NaNoWriMo is that you can, you can try and outline one year yeah. and then try pantsing it the next year and just kind of feel how each one of those creative processes works for you. Because, you know, I, I, I don't think that you have to decide on one and then wear team planter, the team planter <laughs> sweatshirt, you know, like, like, I think it's, I like you to sell those because maybe you should. <laughs> we should. Yeah. Okay. We will. Um, <laughs> You know, I think like uh, there are different moments in a novel where you might want to just be like, okay, I'm going to pants today. I'm going to write really fast. You know, I'm going to write 500 words in, in yeah. the next 10 minutes. And then there are other days where you're like, oh, I'm going to write, I'm going to, I'm going to, I really want to poke around in this paragraph for about an hour. You know, I really right. want to, you know, tweak it. No. So, you know. Which I think is great. I think that that's, I think, what I love about it. And the other thing about Nano is um, if, if a lot of our listeners today are on Twitter, if you follow the hashtag NaNoWriMo, you'll, and and then I always do that with a hashtag writing sprints. Uh -huh. And so I'll call out a writing sprint and I'll tag NaNoWriMo and then you'll get other people writing with you. And then it's, it's, it's not just, for me, NaNo isn't just about, you know, a concentrated month of developing a habit of writing every day. It's, in discovering your story and testing an idea and all that kind of stuff. It's also about building a community. Absolutely. And and can you talk a little bit about that NaNoWriMo community and, and you know, what that's been like for you and the impact it's had on you personally and also just for writers in general? Yeah, it's a fascinating thing because like, you know, when we, you mentioned that we met on Twitter, that's mm -hmm. part of the NaNoWriMo community. I've met so many mm -hmm. people on social media. And, you know, whatever, we're, I've never met them in person, most of them, but we're mm -hmm. in contact and supporting each other's uh, writing in different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. But NaNoWriMo, you know, I'll, I'll just tell a little bit about the story of its, its, its genesis. You know, Chris Beatty uh, basically woke up one day and said, hey, I want to write a novel because I've read, I'm a, I love reading novels. Looked mm -hmm. over at his bookshelf, you know, picked up a very slim volume, said, hey, that's about uh, 50,000 words or so, you know, like The Great mm -hmm. Gatsby. You can do that in 30 days if you write 1,677 words a day. And then he invited 20 of his friends to join him. And so from the very beginning, NaNoWriMo was a community event. Um, mm -hmm. And most writing organizations don't focus on that community, especially mm -hmm. back in 1999. And so what happened uh, when Chris's 20 friends, they would meet in a coffee shop after work, you know, and if somebody didn't show up, they might get a phone call and say, hey, you're still writing your novel. So that community was also uh, had an accountability framework mm -hmm. to it, right? But then they also made fun, writing fun. They did like writing games. So they might challenge each other like, um, you know, whoever can write the most in the next five minutes or 10 minutes will get a latte. And so, you know, they would have a game. And so it would be kind of competitive, a friendly competition. And then, you know, you'd get your latte as a prize. And then the next, the next game might be, you can't go to the bathroom until you've written a thousand words. And this is like the one, number one motivated, most motivational writing technique in the world, especially after you've had a lot of liquids and And, and you had that latte. Yeah. yeah, you had that latte. So anyway, they made it fun and they brought people together. And, you know, I've read all these psychological studies about how people are more creative when they are just with other people. They don't even have to be talking to them. And so NaNoWriMo, you know, we're founded on that and we have uh, mm -hmm. a thousand volunteers. Uh, we call them municipal liaisons. They are literally around the world. Mm -hmm. They, uh, in their communities, they organize events just like the one I described. They'll get 10 or 20 people in a cafe. They'll give people writing prompts and writing sprints or just quiet writing time, whatever it is, it's, it's writing together. And so you're building your, your network and your community of writers through NaNoWriMo, through that shared experience. Mm -hmm. And then we also, we work with about a thousand libraries through our Come Write In program, and they do the same thing. They, they build oh, wow. these writing communities and libraries. And, you know, it started out that most, most of that happened in the NaNoWriMo season in October and November, but now most of those um, volunteers do it year round. Yeah. Um, and then and then that's just the in-person events. So like you said, on um, hashtag NaNoWriMo is trending on a lot of social media platforms in the month of November. Mm -hmm. And there's just so many ways to connect to people online. On our website, we have really vibrant, uh, active forums as well. So, yes, you do. And the other thing that's really cool about the website is I wish we, well, I guess you, you guys could put something in the Q&A, like how many of you do NaNo? Have we done do it? have a Q&A here. Yeah, we do. We do have, uh, we'll go over there, but the, um, the, 
thing that's cool too about the NaNoWriMo website is that you put in what your book is and mm -hmm. what you're working on and 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 then you enter in every day how many words you wrote and then you can see the little bar going yeah and it's for somebody like me who's a competitive freak it's like a little stressful but one of the things I want to say and then we're going to go over the Q&A is that that first year I did it and I ended up with I discovered story but I ended up with something that wasn't really like workable. It was just a glob of not good clay. And so I didn't feel like I could really mold it. I was going to have to start over. So I was always going to go back. I saved it. I still have that file and I'm going to go back and like kind of pull out what's good there and maybe create an outline and then start that book over someday. But what I decided to do the next time was I had a solid idea. I knew I wanted to write it. I had a kind of a plan of where I was going to go. And I decided I was going to focus on making a goal of, instead of 50,000 words, just making a goal of, I just want however many words, hopefully maybe 20,000 that are good words that I can then continue after Nana was done and keep going to get to that goal. And I, I gave myself permission to not focus on the 50,000, but to focus on the, the practice and discipline of sit, sitting and doing it every day. Mm -hmm. And I did end up finishing that book. I haven't published it yet because I want, there's a trilogy and I want to do all of them, but mm -hmm. um, it was amazing. It was amazing. So I thank you for that. Um, oh, sure. And but before I go to the Q and A, I just want to talk about kids. Yeah. The, oh yeah. Nan, because whatever we can do to encourage our children and the children of our friends, um, who sometimes maybe look up to us as, oh, you're a writer, you're right, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the kids program that you that you do. Yeah, it's uh, called the Young Writers Program, and it's a separate website, a separate program from the main Nanorimo site, and about a hundred thousand kids and teens participate every year. And we support about 10,000 classrooms with free novel writing resources, including a uh, curriculum aligned to the Common Core. And the website has, you know, these virtual classrooms, a writing platform where kids can also track their uh, word count, uh, daily word count and the goals. Um, yeah, so we just, everything is free. That's what I should, should also uh, emphasize. It's great. Everything we do is free no matter what. Um, and that's because we want to provide access to creativity to as many people as possible. That's our mission. Yeah. We're a nonprofit too. Yeah. So, yeah, so donate to NaNoWriMo. Just yeah. Say. That's why I plugged the t-shirt earlier in the mug. And uh, yeah, yeah we, we do love donations because it helps us do good yeah. in the world. You know what I've learned is like people like to invest in uh, businesses and get a return on their investment. Mm -hmm. not, not a lot of people like to yeah, I mean, we're very blessed because our participants, we actually are, we run on the $25 donations that our participants give us, but yeah. uh, we get nothing from the publishing industry, despite uh, forming a pipeline of books that goes straight mm -hmm. to them that they make a lot of money off of. It's unfortunate, yeah. but, um, but yeah, so yeah. That is really interesting. <laughs> it's a uh, criminal in my book, but yeah. Yeah. And I, and, you know, I still have so many questions for you, but I also want to make sure that the people who are, who are spending their, their time with us tonight get to answer, to ask some questions. Yeah. So Lee has been, had asked a question quite a while ago. What's the best way to keep from falling behind in NaNoWriMo? If I miss three or four days, I'm tempted to bail. Yeah, that's something we face a lot. And, um, you know, in, in a course of a month, it, it is hard to write every day. And mm -hmm. so most people will miss a day or two. And it's easy that once you you fall behind in your word count, to then be like, I can't catch up. And uh, I hate to hear the stories of people dropping <gasps> out, um, especially when they drop out after only three or four days. And so I think, I, you know, I think there are a lot of different ways to go about it. But I would say kind of recalibrate your goal. Um, if you can't hit 50,000 words, don't let that be something that pushes you out of writing. Set a goal of 40,000 words or 30,000, whatever it is, whatever you need to do to write, because the main premise of this event is to write. And there's so many things you get out of that writing experience, even if you don't hit 50,000 words, that I just think you should keep, keep showing up to write. And, you know, we've heard amazing stories. Sometimes people get second, third, fourth wins. Sometimes, you know, they think they're going to lose and they will write five or 10,000 words on a Saturday when they're really inspired. So who knows, you know, you might regain that momentum and catch up. Um, but I've had so many people actually come up to me 
and kind of hang their head and apologize for only writing 10,000 words in a month. And I'm like, only 10,000 words, you know, uh, if you do that every month of the year, that's 120,000 words in a year, that's practically two novels. So um, just be proud of what you're writing. And, and I think that'll give you the juice to keep going. Yeah, and also like what I did for that nano that the second time I did it, I only wrote on the weekends because I apologize if you guys can hear my dog in the background, but um, that because the weekends, it was just unrealistic for me to do it Monday through Friday with my job. So I just said, you know what, I'm just going to do it on the weekends. And then that was, it was so liberating because it was not stressful. It mm -hmm. was, this is my time. This is my time to write. Yeah. I don't have to worry about emails or anything that I'm doing for work. And so just don't beat yourself up. Exactly. You know what? I mean, part of NaNoWriMo is having confidence in your story and, and telling yourself that your story matters. And that's just such a more joyful way to write, you know, just mm -hmm. try, try to be proud of what you write and mm -hmm. try to, you know, convince yourself that it matters and have confidence. So, yeah. yeah. Do you get um, writer's block? No, I actually don't believe in writer's block. And, he and here's why. I have scientific evidence in case you don't believe me. So, so I've done hundred, hundreds, maybe thousands of what, you know, word, word sprints with groups. And basically word sprint is I'll, I'll give a prompt and I'll say, write as much as you can for five minutes. And it, it, all these thousands of people I've, I've dealt with, I haven't had one not be able to write. And so um, I think the only thing we need is like an invitation to write, you know, like that prompt and, and open up the doors just to crack. And there are words and stories in our brain just ready to come out. You know, we don't even have to think about them, plan them, outline. They just happen. And so I, I don't believe, um, you know, I believe you can tell yourself you have writer's block. Um, I believe that you can be fatigued or, or anxious and just not feel like writing. Um, I think, like, if you have legitimate trauma or depression, that's an entirely different thing. But yeah. um, I think that if you really want to write, you could give yourself a prompt and five minutes and words would come out. Yeah. I think it's more, from my experience, I think writer's block is more um, just procrastination. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, writer's but block I, is like, like procrastination is fear generally. Yeah. Right. And so I think writer's block has like elements of fear. There's emotional components to it that we yeah. can, we convince ourselves that those emotions, you know, we, we follow those emotions instead of figuring out techniques to get, get around them. Yeah. Well, even like how you said in the beginning, when you were talking about the first time you tried nano, you wanted to explore and try because something wasn't working in the, in this, the routine that you had. Mm -hmm. And so that's not necessarily a block. It's just a, a kind of a wall or stumble or just a slog, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you tried something different. So I would recommend to those people who feel blocked, who feel like they can't, get past that to just try something different, you know, yeah, exactly. whether writing a different time of the day or going out for a walk. Like sometimes I come up with the best story ideas when I'm not sitting in front of the laptop. Yeah. Yeah. Tr you trust know? being away from the laptop. Yeah. Go out yeah. and live. Living's and you know good. What? It's okay to go a few months without writing. Do, do, I mean, like it's okay. Like Go live your life. Stop. Don't force it. I feel like when you're forcing it, that's when you end up getting blocked because you're, it's like you're all tangled up. Live. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, someone had said, based on a comment that you said earlier, life is never mastered. So isn't writing kind of like life? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think there, yeah, mastery is more of an idea than a reality. Mm -hmm. But I think writing is one of those activities that's so challenging that you can't even imagine mastering it. Um, I think like when you were talking about, uh, I think you were talking about the first recognition that you, you would see in a child of their self-consciousness, that what they wrote, you know, or drew or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, didn't measure up. And they actually, that happens around fourth grade for a lot of people. And it's because before fourth grade, it has to do with the developmental quality of your brain kids will draw trees and cars and the sky and whatever, and they will think it matches pretty perfectly. Mm -hmm. But by fourth grade, they start to scrutinize it and say, hey, that car mm -hmm. doesn't look really look like a real car, you know? Yeah. And so they'll, their inner critic will start to, to develop at that age. And then there's plenty of societal forces that keep nourishing that inner critic in different ways. Um, 
And so, the, yeah, go ahead. One of the things that I did in my, at the, my old house in my office, I put up for this exact reason. I put up, I framed and put up pictures that my kids had painted mm -hmm. when they were in second grade. And to remind myself, always create with that kind of freedom. Yeah. And I still have them. We moved into a smaller house, so I don't have room to, but I'm hanging them up in, in, um, I'm going to find a place to put them. <laughs> I can't fit them in my office, but I'm going to find a place to put them. It's a good reminder. Um, okay. So Chelsea wants to know, how does one get on this America's next great authorship? <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's, uh, we're filming the pilot in Newark. And so we do have all of our contestants picked for that portion mm -hmm. of the show. So we got a, we accepted a, we had, a, ton of submissions we accepted a hundred tell us people. about it what, what is the show what is it what yeah is it? um so yeah so we're just shooting the pilot and then once we have the pilot we will hopefully get funding from a network and it will be a real show uh, mm -hmm. where chelsea can audition to be on the show so it's basically i i the shorthand for it is it's it's american idol but for writers uh that <laughs> that's act one so act one, people get up on stage and they pitch their novel. They have one minute to pitch their novel. And then we choose, we're going to go to six American cities and we'll choose one contestant from each city. And that, so that's the American Idol, but for writer's part, act two, see, I tell everything like the storytelling, I'm trying, right. to, trying yeah, to get but that's beginning, perfect. middle and end. And so act two is, is um, essentially uh, the contestants are all uh, going to live in this uh, hopefully very glamorous house. Uh, and write together for guess how many days? 30 days. <laughs> They're going to write their novel, 50,000 words in 30 days. And so it's going to be kind of like the real world, but for writers. And it's so, like Hollywood week. Yeah. It's like American Idol's Hollywood week. Yeah. When they, like it's brutal. Yeah. So there'll be, people will be living together and writing together and there'll be a lot of drama there and a lot of educational opportunities. And we're going to have like a lot of, uh, celebrity guest authors and judges who will, you know, both uh, give instruction and pep talks and all that sort of thing. And then the end goal is that everybody will publish their novel. I love this. So then, wow, this is amazing. Like I would watch this all day. I still watch American Idol. So I didn't know if it was going to be like, pro it's kind of like a, it's also almost like Project Greenlight meets yep. American Idol. Yeah. Yeah. They're different different uh, reality shows that are kind of part of this or influence it yeah that's really yeah cool. but the whole the whole premise of it too though is that i mean we, we want it to be an educational experience uh mm -hmm. i i i want we, we want to get a very diverse group of writers you know writing together um we want these writers to essentially be role models for everybody so like mm -hmm. i'm thinking of the nanorimo principle like like let's let's all write together i would i would love if this show can air during November that we can get like, you know, essentially America's Americans, America as a country writing novels together, you know, because yeah, I want people really to, cool. Yeah. I want people's stories to be told and put out there in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that sounds really fascinating. I love this idea. Um, okay. So keep us posted okay. on, on how that goes and um, we'll have to have you back. Um, even if you just come on the podcast or something like that, so that we can, once you're ready to launch that, cause it's going to get picked up and then that would be really cool. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Follow thank the you. journey of that show. Yeah. Um, so somebody says, what's your thought about authors that don't rewrite and believe that the story is ready on the first draft? Maybe uh, publishers don't, <laughs> the public, maybe the publishers or the lit agents get too many people submitting their first draft of their nano rock. Oh, you know, people, people, people have said that, but I've yet to talk to the NaNoWriMo writer who submitted their first draft. You know, I think that that's a myth. I think like people like to, to say that. I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's happened and it happens, but mm -hmm. uh, gen generally I think they're smart enough to know that, that writing is rewriting, as many people say, uh, that, that most novels go through several rounds of revision at the very least. Mm -hmm. And so I would say to this writer, I, I you know, there have been novels like written pretty quickly in history, but you know what? Like even even Jack Kerouac's On the Road, which is like supposedly famously um, just a first draft, he actually revised that. You mm -hmm. know, so so I think it's it's I think there's a lot to be said for revision, 
And so I would, if, if a writer told me I'm done with this, it's perfect after one draft, I would encourage them to look at it more skeptically and to, um, I think that you, you deepen the story so much through revision, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're really going for with stories is to find the, the you know, the essence of the story and to, 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 to go deep with it. And so, yeah, I, I encourage everybody to revise. And you do have some like revision videos on the site, don't you? Absolutely. We have a program called I Wrote a Novel Now What um, that starts in January and we explore mm -hmm. revision and publishing and, uh, you know, try to provide some guidance. We had a special revision workshop series this year. Yeah. Um, so we provide a bunch of different like, like resources and help for that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's so great too about it. It's not, it's just, you're encouraging writers, but you're educating them. And it's, it's so helpful for them to understand what the whole process is. Mm -hmm. um, and then somebody was talking about outlining, wanted to know if you outlined, and we kind of touched on that a little bit, but like, do you have any kind of a method that you use when you outline, when you do that broad stroke? Yeah, I outline, you know, like I start, I think when I started out, I was more on the pantsing side of things and I'm, mm -hmm. I consider myself more of a planter now. Um, I've experimented with outlines in the past, but I, I, I like to, I like to essentially spend the month of October kind of daydreaming and writing notes and finding my story and my characters, especially. And, and I like to, and actually somewhere in the, in the month of October towards NaNoWriMo, I will actually read Save the Cat for Novelists that Jessica oh. Brody wrote. And I like it because I, I, I write, I read it uh, as a brainstorming exercise mm -hmm. because it makes me think about my novel. And I also read novels that are similar to the one that I'm writing as a way to kind of mm -hmm. prime myself. And so I come up with an outline. Um, it's not a, um, a rigid outline and it doesn't go deep. It just provides me like direction. I find them best if I have a clear sense of direction. But mm -hmm. again, I'm writing for the mystery of the story. I'm writing for discovery. I'm writing to find answers to the questions. And mm -hmm. so that's just where I need to be as a writer. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I might set up a spine of, of the novel. I might set up uh, in my software, like whatever, 10, 20 chapters. Uh, I might do some character background work, stuff like that, and think about yeah. some scenes. But but really, it's it's it is discovery. I like to keep that discovery very prominent. What um, software do you use to write? Do you use, do you use Scrivener? Or I do actually you do use Scrivener for novels. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I use Word a lot for shorter stories. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Scrivener is very intimidating, but it's <laughs> really it's. It, it, there's a lot of videos out there on how to how to use it. Um, and then somebody asked, um, uh, love that site. I think they're talking about NaNoWriMo, um, would love to be a leader at an upcoming NaNoWriMo. Do you have those in person session or is everything online? Uh, not everything's online. Um, you, you can volunteer to be mus mus municipal liaisons or apply to be. And so that application process will open up next year. So I think it opens up around May. Um, so yeah, so this year is not a possibility, but you could actually go and sign up for your region and uh, get to know your municipal liaison because municipal liaison, sometimes there's not just one for a region. They, there are co municipal liaisons as well, or people that just help out, um, mm -hmm. the volunteer. And so I think like getting, the more you're engaged in your, um, NaNoWriMo writing community, then, you know, you'll be kind of train yourself in terms of how, how to do that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, as the Chelsea asks, as the nano guy, oh, you are you a pantser? He's a planter. Um, we just talked about your process, I guess. Um, and and then we already talked about the show. So we're good on that one. Um, uh, somebody wants to join in this year. Um, so that's good. Trying to cipher through this because the chat... Um, how long does it take for you to finish your first draft? Meaning beyond NaNoWriMo? Beyond the fit, because a first draft of a full novel is more than 50,000 words. So how, so after NaNo, like after NaNo, do you take a break? Do you mm -hmm. walk away for a little bit? Or do you just keep plowing through to get that first draft done? I think it depends on my life circumstances and all the projects I'm working on. And if the NaNoWriMo project has become my primary project, uh, generally, we advise people to step away from your mm -hmm. draft for a while. I, I would say if you've only written 50,000 words and it's a 75,000 word novel, keep going if you can. Um, but then once you've written that rough draft, I really think that taking um, some time off a month or so 
um, whatever you need, because I, I just feel like you need to refresh yourself. At least I do. Mm -hmm. And you come back to it with a more objective um, eye and uh, revision is its own kind of special separate thing, you know? And mm -hmm. so I, I, I like having a lot of uh, objectivity and distance. Like sometimes I might not print out my rough draft, but I might revise that rough draft. And then I like having a print copy for some hardcore revision. Yeah. So I print it out. I get out of my house. I go to a cafe or I go, you know, drive away and stay in a cheap motel for two days. Um, whatever I can do to get away from, from my normal circumstances so that I have just a different eye on what I'm writing. Um, and I might end up doing more revision. I always do more revisions than I think I will. I mm -hmm. always think it's done before it's truly done. So I have to then either get feedback or put it out into the world. And once I experience that um, bit of rejection or some negative comments, then I will dive back in for more revision. Yeah. So I do a lot of revision. There's, um, like I was thinking about writing retreats the other day for some reason. And um, and really all the, I mean, you can create your own writing retreat. Yes. Time, like you did for a lot less money and <laughs> yes and just big... really, the beauty all that it is is removing yourself from your regular routine in life exactly and yourself someplace fresh where you're not distracted by life i'm a big fan of the mini writing retreat like i mentioned the the mm -hmm. like a long weekend writing retreat or just a weekend um mm -hmm. my wife who's a writer we have all all these conversations because you know because like i usually don't have the time or the money to go away for like a week right. or two or a month. And so right. I have to figure out how I can do that in my, my life. And so we're always like, so you have to go, here are our definitions. <laughs> you, ha you have, you can't go to a place where you want a vacation or really mm -hmm. you can't go someplace where there's a lot of pleasure to be had because mm -hmm. you want to be working on your novel. You can't go too far away because you don't want to spend so much time like traveling, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we're, we're always like, you've got to go within an hour or two, far enough away that you're not going to be called home as well. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thinking yeah. about like, what, what would be the most creative spot near your home where you can get away just enough? And I think what's good about the shortness the, of the duration is mm -hmm. that if you're, then you know, you got to get right to it. Exactly. It's, it's like, if you've got a week, you're like, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. A weekend's great. Because the weekend is great. It, it, it's sort of like NaNoWriMo. It puts that like goal deadline pressure on you. Yep. Yeah. Get it going. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is a good question. Yep. What are your criteria for telling a legitimate from a con man type of self-publishing organization? And which ones do you feel comfortable recommending, if any? Wait, what was the question? Con you know, man? like there's all these, there's all these like, you know, organizations like, we'll help you get your book published and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and it's hard sometimes to tell for authors or those, the, there's a lot of good hybrid organizations um, yeah. that, but some that are just a bit, a bit, like you feel like they're a con man. Like, how do you know? I think, yeah, it's a really good question. Cause I think the unfortunate part about the publishing world is there are some very predatory businesses out there. Mm -hmm. And I usually go straight to this website, Writer Beware, mm -hmm. and just see if, um, uh, I think Victoria Strauss is the name of the woman who runs it, um, but she yeah. basically, her whole mission in life is to uncover scams and to investigate whether something was legit or not. Um, so I see if she's written about it, and that's my go-to <laughs> my, my go -to place, really, because she's covered a lot of things, a lot yeah. of issues. Or if she hasn't covered like a specific business, she'll say, here's what you should look out for, you mm -hmm. know? And um, I think uh, there are, though, great, you know, it just depends what you're looking for. You know, there's, there's so many... Um, writing there may be writing more writing services than ever these days right you can yeah. hire somebody you've never met to cover to do your cover design or to um be a book coach for you or edit your novel so i haven't personally done those um and like you say there are like really legit great hybrid publishers like my uh right-minded uh podcast co-host brooke warner mm -hmm. founded one she writes press she's very yeah. she's full of integrity so yeah. yeah yeah that's that's a very good one um the, um, okay, so somebody was asking this little logistical stuff, if they already have about 6,000 words written, like, is it okay for them to jump into NaNo? Well, the NaNoWriMo purists would say no. 
Uh, the NaNoWriMo <laughs> purists would say it's best to start with an entirely new project and start from entirely from scratch. And I do think that there's some uh, a great deal of like fun and creative challenge in doing that. Um, I, I, I guess I'm not a purist as much in life. Um, I, I think the main thing I want people to do is to, to show up to write and to write in a way that's meaningful to, for them. And mm -hmm. so I'd say, sure, show up with 6,000 words and just uh, have the goal of 30 days and 50,000 words and see if you can do it. Yeah. Um, okay. Any, and I agree with that. I think just, you know, jump in because um, any progress you're making is, is good. Yeah. I um, never want to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any suggestions on gathering the motivation to write scenes that you're avoiding? That's interesting. Um, I mean, I, when when people are blocked in the NaNoWriMo novel, when they reach a scene that they don't want to write or they're having trouble with, I always say, go ahead and skip scenes, skip to later in the novel, write mm -hmm. something you really want to write. And, uh, and that in turn, uh, not only helps you keep your novel progressing, but it, I hope it gives uh, you creative fuel and juice to go back and write that scene that you're avoiding or having a tough time with. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like to think of a lot of ways that, to create momentum in your writing. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess you need to although ask yourself like, why, what is it about that scene you don't wanna write? Like, is it a triggering scene? Is it a personal scene, a personal memory? That's like, you know what I mean? That's kind of traumatic. So I, I don't know exactly how to answer this, but maybe maybe don't even write it as a scene. Maybe do what you were saying earlier, like don't sit in front of your laptop, take a walk, you know, take a notebook with you, stop in a cafe, you know, just do some free writing about the scene. I mean, what I find sometimes is that all you need is a paragraph mm -hmm. and that, that, that paragraph is the door opener, you know, yeah. you just need to create a little momentum. Uh, one sentence usually leads to two sentences. And one paragraph usually leads to two paragraphs. So maybe it's just a matter of finding a way to start it. Or write the scene as a hundred word story. <laughs> you could do that too. Yeah. You know, Draw and it. yeah. One of the things too that I do when I get stuck or when I'm just trying to test a story idea is I do a stream of consciousness writing where mm -hmm. I set the timer for 15 minutes and I just write whatever's coming to my mind, whatever. And you could even write. You could even do a stream of consciousness to get yourself warmed up, talking yeah. about why you don't want to write the scene. It's like what you did is like the Pomodoro technique, right? Mm -hmm. um, where you, you do you, you do a timer like that. I just talked to and Andrew yeah. Bartz, the woman I just uh, interviewed for our right minded. She does that. She takes her phone. She doesn't use the timer on her phone. She puts that in another room, mm -hmm. but she sets the timer for like 15 or 20 minutes. And she does exactly that. She has to intensely write for that period of time, no matter what just put yeah. words on the page yeah and they they do the there's also one theory where you do the stream of consciousness writing is like it's just it's not so much about the timer as it is about just writing anything that comes to your mind mm -hmm. you know um but when the 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 other methods that also have worked for me is in terms of what i'm actually ready to write right you know mm -hmm. is 25 minutes writing and five minute break mm-hmm Yep. That's what yeah. she does too. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is, you know, the 25 minutes, I don't know. It just feels more like there's more pressure on me than 30 minutes. Like, it's like, mm -hmm. okay, I gotta, I gotta get going. It's only 25 minutes. I could, you know, and then I get a break. I get to reward myself with a latte. There you go. Or the bathroom. <laughs> there you go. Do the latte, <laughs> then do the bathroom technique. Yeah. Um, Oh, they, somebody was asking if, if anybody's given any thought to National Novel Revision Month. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's essentially what we do with I Wrote a Novel, Now What? But I, I would like to eventually kind of formalize that and have a revision month. So yeah. that is in the NaNoWriMo plan. Um, so what do you do to stay motivated for yourself personally? Um. I've never worried about that, I guess. I'm, I am just kind of naturally motivated. I hate to say it, but I've got uh, more writing projects than I'll ever get to in my life already. And I come up with story ideas all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, my biggest frustration in life is that I don't have more time to write them. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that just because I, yeah, I yeah. don't struggle with that. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but um, you, go ahead. 
no no go ahead. keep going no i was just kind of rambling but um <laughs> I mean, I mean, we all have different motivational levels for different activities, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess it's a matter of like just deciding what place you want writing to have in your life, you know? And if you want to have, want it to have a very primary place, um, you know, even think of it like an athlete. What does an athlete have to do to show up and be mm -hmm. good, you know, if, you, mm -hmm. if it has that kind of primary place? And mm -hmm. I mean, if you're not that motivated to do it, you know, maybe it's, maybe having a primary place and maybe maybe it needs to have a more secondary place it's not like you have to get rid of it in your life plenty of people and that's why i mentioned that that we have plenty of people who participate in NaNoWriMo and they only write a novel once a year they don't write the rest of the year they just like writing a novel with their friends once a year so it's kind of like like knitting um you don't have to professionalize your you can do art for art's sake you know mm -hmm. um so I, I guess it's just like what what do you want out of this activity and uh and then the motivation will probably follow does it help that your wife is a writer uh it probably does you know like we we never misunderstand each other when it comes mm -hmm. to writing you know we we know that we each want more time uh we, obviously we know the struggles um on many different levels um i can't i mean i, I we've been together forever so I don't know what it would be like to be married to somebody who's not a writer, you know, like, I don't know what those conversations would be like. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. Well, well, I can tell you, <laughs> <laughs> but we won't go into that. No. Um, uh, somebody was asking if they, um, if you ever recommend, like, would you recommend purchasing Kirkus reviews? Like if you're self-published author. Oh yeah. Well, I've heard that that's a pretty standard practice, but mm -hmm. I'm not the greatest person to ask for advice for things like that. Um, cause I haven't really gone through the whole life cycle of an, an indie book that I've self-published. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I know there's a challenge about getting reviews for self-published books. Uh, I, I know people who have gotten those Kirkus reviews and they do charge for them. So, mm -hmm. but we do have a symposium that Karen Richardson taught, um, mm -hmm. about all the basics of self-publishing really really good in depth you can um, find mm -hmm. it on the symposium site if you look on the tab mm -hmm. under publishing um and she went into some deep dives um uh she's awesome i'll have to introduce you to her uh, oh, right. in real life um uh somebody wanted to know if there can be somebody from canada like i'm not sure i i I'm thinking they're talking about perhaps a leader or liaison kind of person. Yeah. Well, one, uh, NaNoWriMo is a national novel writing month is global. It's really international novel writing month. We have, have generally people from like 200 countries each year, right? We've had people yeah. on all seven uh, continents, right? And yes, you can be also a leader from one of these other countries. The thousand volunteers that I mentioned, they are global as well. So, Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then somebody asked again about the, I think it was probably the same person, um, just wanted to make sure we heard the answer about the the con man, which would your writer beware site is a great idea. Um, Chelsea asked what Scrivener is. Scrivener is not free, but it's cheap. It's really, really very inexpensive software. It's a very robust writing software that almost does too much. Mm -hmm. Like it, I almost feel like there should be a Scrivener light, you know? Yeah, it does do a lot. You don't need to, know, but you, you know, like I know maybe 10% of it. I, I use mm -hmm. only, the, and I was talking to the, the founder of Scrivener the other day and he was, he was fine with that. He was like, you don't need yeah. to know. I mean, most yeah. of the software we use in life, we really don't know all that it does. Yeah. We just use what's good for us. But um, yeah, Scrivener's, I would guide people to the NaNoWriMo site. And if you go under writer's resources, you'll see special offers. And we have a bunch of sponsors there who offer discounts on their products and services. And there are a bunch of uh, writing softwares or writing platforms, and they're really cool. They do a lot of cool stuff, mm -hmm. including Scrivener. And Scrivener was actually developed by an NaNoWriMo writer way back in like cool. 2005. A bunch of so writing software has been developed by NaNoWriMo writers who have been dissatisfied with like Word for one. Yeah. And so it's pretty cool though, because to have a it software is. developed by a writer, you know, it just has a has a different different uh, kind of texture to it. And you can customize a lot of it, and you can you you make these little chapters that all become part of the book. So you can I mean, it's it's I would definitely look into it. Go on YouTube to look at videos about 
you know, just Google, you know, put in Scrivener how to and YouTube and and just get a feel for it. But it's very affordable software and does a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know where I saw it. Somebody, I think I've passed it or lost it. Um, somebody talked about writing sprints. They want to jump into writing sprints on Twitter. Um, you can follow me at Jeannie VB and, um, and then just tweet me and be like, hey, I want to do writing sprints with you. And um, I'll create a list and, and we can all join in and do writing sprints together. Um, yeah. Always That's tag me whenever you want to do a sprint. I'm happy to, to jump in. You can also, um, I want you to do it with Jeannie. But also there's um, at Nano Word Sprints on Twitter. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so we've got um, during November, they're happening 24 hours a day. And so those, all those volunteers around the world, uh, they volunteer and, and do Twitter shifts. So you can do it online that way as well. And when we do the recording of this, we'll, I'll try to include as many of these resources that we're talking about. And um, But definitely the Nano site and where you get the software and for the teens, for the kids and all that stuff. Cool. Um, so you guys can get it all in the recording email. Um, let's see. We're kind of running out of time here, Grant. <laughs> Uh-oh. I know. What happens when your idea comes out of nowhere and threatens to hijack your plans? <laughs> what happens if this happens every week? Yeah, good question. No. Uh, yeah. Um, I always say to write the novel that's calling you. Um, I think if, if, there's, I, if you're um, getting a bunch of ideas that are hijacking your plans, focus on that word hijack. Um, like, I think you, to, there, there, I mean, if we're always chasing new ideas and new ideas always seem better than the idea you're working on, by the way. So it's, they're very seductive, um, but they quickly become an old idea when another new idea comes around. And mm -hmm. so I think you, need, you think you need to question yourself. Like if you want to finish one of those ideas and really finish the novel, then it's going to take a lot of discipline. Yeah. It's going to take also a lot of ideas that just seem better, you know, like, mm -hmm. like there will be moments in writing your novel, even if it's just an NaNoWriMo for 30 days, where you'll hate your novel idea. You'll, be, you'll totally lose faith in it. You'll hit a wall. And, but that's usually temporary. You, you will find a way it's, it, it really is like, like, like romance in some ways, you know, it's like, you're going to go through your low periods, but that's the way to, to kind of deepen the love, you know, to experience struggle together. Yeah. Now my dog's getting antsy. Well, my dog's sitting next to me too, <laughs> but um, uh, we'll let you go. go we'll, we'll just try to wrap uh, this up. But somebody was talking uh, about, yeah, somebody was talking about um, how do you keep yourself like? Do you edit as you're going along with the first rough draft, or do you do you try to just get through the whole thing before you go back? Like, yeah, people people have different. I mean, the, the kind of old school nanorama philosophy is to always focus on progress, never stop to delete a word, never stop to edit. I actually sometimes like to edit in order to get momentum. I need to have things like a little bit tidy. So if I've got plenty of time, I, I actually like to edit a little bit, but not not to get stuck in editing. You know, <laughs> you can get stuck in it and keep trying to make things perfect. And like when I used to, I mean, one of my writing methods when I was early on, when I was a writer, like I would just work on that first chapter until it was absolutely perfect before mm -hmm. I could move on. And what happens is that inevitably in your second or third draft, that first chapter gets cut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, jo Joyce Keller said, you don't know the first word of your novel until you've written the last word of it, yes. or the last sentence. And so I think there's really something about that discovery draft, finding your story, you know, and then you go back and revise. But, but if you're doing too much revision, you know what I mean? You, you, it's yeah. kind of kind of an ineffective writing method, really. Yeah, like in the the book I'm working on now, like in the beginning, people put so much, it, and it's important those that those, that first sentence, that first paragraph, super important. So when you're sitting there and you don't even know your story yet, how are, how are you going to know your first paragraph? I literally put something like, "This will be a great paragraph," and then I went on, I started writing. <laughs> like, yeah. Just, and just like, I'll go back to that. And and I actually learned that from Douglas Blackman, who's a, um, a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And um, and he said to me, even with writing articles, because he used to be a senior national correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. And he used to say, I never start, like never write. 
that first, I worry, I'll, I will know what my first paragraph is of my article once I'm done writing the article yeah. and I'll come back and I'll know what, how I should frame it. Um, Cause you're still discovering what you're going to say about whatever it is you're writing. So, Absolutely. yeah. So don't get hung up on that. You know, I often will be like, write something brilliant here. Or if there's that scene that you don't want to write, you know, write like, this is what I want to happen in that scene. Yeah. So you've got like a placeholder for it and good then advice. keep going. I think that's great advice. Yeah. Um, somebody said, uh, what about the book seven drafts? It scares the bleep, bleep, bleep out of me <laughs> that it might take me that long to write my memoir. Could it be less? I don't think there's any rule of how many drafts something takes you. Not at all. No, I think it's, it's, and even the question of what is, what is done? How do you know it's done? It's such a personal, you have to give a personal answer to that. Um, so yeah, I, I would revise it until it meets mm -hmm. your standards and, yeah. and writing a memoir has, you know, I don't know if that, if the person wants to publish the memoir or if it's just for themselves or for family. Um, but you know, it's a personal judgment. Yeah. Somebody asked us to repeat the name of that. Um, the, the site's called writer beware, beware. Um, mm -hmm. so, and we'll put that, we'll put that in the, in the email too, so that you've got that. Um, see, I'm scrolling through a lot of great mm -hmm. comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're great. Blah, blah, blah. Aww, you nice. meeting you, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Oh, um, and then somebody asked if there was, uh, if we could use an idea from something that we've already written for Nano. And I think that speaks to your um, purist versus whatever. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, have you heard of the 20 books to 50K Facebook group? I have. I I belong to it because I like to just learn and, and, and I'm a lurker too, uh -huh. Christina. Um, but it seems like a great place for self-publishing to go and commiserate. A lot of good info is shared in there. And there are many people in the group who are successful. They also have, if you guys join that, it's called 20 books to 50 K all one word. It's a Facebook group and right in the, they have a lot of resources where, and the goal, the whole purpose of that group is if you write 20 books, you can be making $50,000 a year because you've got a backlist and all that stuff takes a big commitment to write 20 books. Um, and no one has talked about necessarily the quality of those 20 books, <laughs> but I would recommend to anybody self-publishing to still get a good editor because you know you want to rise above a lot of noise in self-publishing, but that's a very good site. The people on there, the Facebook group, the people on there are super, super helpful. Um, let's see. Um, oh, somebody said that uh, uh, her husband, um, that she and her husband are both filmmakers and writers. So our conversations are pretty interesting and weird. <laughs> I bet. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. My husband's not a writer, but he's a very good idea man. And so we'll brainstorm stuff sometimes, which is helpful. Um, do you have any suggestions for obtaining a literary agent? Uh, that is a tough thing to do, actually. Mm -hmm. I think um, there are a bunch of different ways you can go about it. I mean, I do a lot of research about it to start uh, more than what I can tell you here. Uh, it's really about that query letter. It's really about the quality of your writing. It's really about being relentless because you'll likely get a lot of rejections. Um, it's, it's, it's hard, I think. Um, there's so many different types of literary agents and some of them have a full client list. You know, they might represent your favorite author, but they might have a full client list. So I always, I always say, especially for beginning novelists, don't, don't necessarily try to go for those big name agents. Um, look for ones who are even junior agents just beginning out because they're going to put a lot more energy. Uh, they're looking for clients, um, put a lot more energy into your book. Um, but, you know, I think, I think um, don't be bashful. Ask anybody you know who has an agent uh, if they will do an introduction. Um, I think the more kind of like personal interactions you can have with agents, I mean, I'm a little bit Sometimes I don't like to send people to write, you know, writing conferences because they could be very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but but if if there's a way for you to kind of talk with agents and have some direct contact with them, I think that that can be good too to to establish some sort of rapport. But it's a, you know, unfortunately, like New York publishing, that's where most of the agents are. It's a very kind of closed society in some ways. I have to say, 
and it can be hard to to penetrate it. Uh, so that's when I when I said that you have to be relentless. You really do have to be relentless, mm -hmm. and you have to do your research. So it, it takes a lot of work. Generally, some people luck out. Some people will like have an agent, like the third agent who reads their query letter, will take them yeah. on. But that's a rare story, actually. But also, I think I got a couple of thoughts about the agent thing, if I may. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually worked the Pitch Slam room for Writers Digest Conference this last year, um, mm -hmm. and I love pitching. I am obsessed with pitching. It's a, and screenwriting taught me the whole yeah. art of pitch. Um, and I did a a whole free symposium about that, like how to work a, a speed pitching event. But like like you said, going to and and there are other conferences that have agents present and an opportunity to pitch them when they can see you face to face. It sets you apart. It's it's it all like, whatever you can. If there's a way you can afford to go to a conference, but look up, look up, research them, find one that's close to you that maybe you can drive to instead of fly to, or or yep. maybe maybe you meet some friends online and you all go together and it's a way to you also are networking with each other. But with pitching agents, um, it's really like when you're going to, there's ways that you can find out what they're looking for. There's a website mm -hmm. manuscript wish list yep. where you can go on and see exactly what they're looking for. Um, follow them on Twitter yep. because it gives you an idea of what their personality is like. And, and they also will say on Twitter, sometimes right in their bio, I'm open for querying or I'm closed for querying right now. Um, you can get a lot of great information just about, or, or if you're, if you have submitted a query, then they might be like, okay, I'm backlogged. You know, I'm about three months behind Hang in there, everybody. Like, it, you know, it gives you a little bit more insight into them. Um, and also whether, you know, remember you're choosing a partner for your team and you may be so focused on getting an agent that you're not focused on getting the right agent. So the first True. agent that says, I want, I want to represent you. And you're like, oh my God, an agent wants to represent me. And then you realize you just stepped in like a hot mess situation. Um, not, and not because the agent's a bad person, just because they might not be the right person for you. It just right. like you said before, very much like dating. I mean, you're, you're, and it's okay to break up with your agent and to do it professionally. So there's no hard feelings that eat. And it might be, you know, like it's all okay. It might take you three tries before you get the agent. That's the right one for you. Totally. And, I mean, in terms of like three agents that you're going through, but, and it can take you 85 pitches to, to get easily, easily, easily. So the number high. Yep. Right. And it doesn't mean that you aren't desirable or that your work isn't desirable it's just finding the right person and i would i would say i always say do you want it done right or do you want it done right now mm -hmm. and that is triple true with agents like or in screenwriting with managers you you want the right person representing you so be patient just like you wouldn't want to marry the first guy who asked you mm -hmm. and <laughs> like i you would, for, but for the research level too, like um, I would go to like Publishers Marketplace. Right. If you if you research it, there'll be a bunch of sites like this. But Publishers Marketplace, you can see all the deals that have been made. Yeah. Uh, what book What books have sold for how much? Who represented them? And then, like you were saying, um, it, like if you can't go to writers conferences, there are actually a lot of like pitch events on Twitter and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I can't name them off the top of my head, but there's a big one that just actually folded. Right. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, but um. But anyway, there, there are a lot of different ways to go about it. And so I would research those different ways and, and you know, try your yep. hand at them. Yeah. Yep. Um, you, you know, somebody asked how you find junior agents. Their Writer's Digest is a really great, I don't work for them anymore, but I used to work for them. Wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, they've been around for a hundred years. So um, they have, I know they used to have an, a column out where they would. I love that column. Introduce, yeah. yeah. Introduce a new agent. Yeah. And, um, but you can just search literary agents or meet the agent. I can't remember what they used to call it. Something like that. Yeah. You can, it's still available if you Google it. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if they're still, if it's actively being updated, but, um, that was a great feature. Um, yeah. but yeah. Um, and most agents they have, if you go to their, like, if you hear, oh, you know, this, this agent, you know, represents my favorite author, you can go and see, they'll usually tell you like what they're looking for, you know? Yeah. 
but you got to know the industry, you know, up yep. market, up market women's fiction. You got to know what that means. Yeah. I mean, there's so many yeah. <laughs> things yeah. out there. And um, Chelsea also uh, shouted out a podcast that I love, and it's really great to help you with query letters. Um, it's called the shit. No one tells you about writing. Um, okay. really good podcast. And they analyze, they have two agents on and they analyze, um, I think three query letters or something. And then they go into, um, and then she goes into whatever her discussion is or topic is for the podcast, but that's how they start every podcast. It's really good. There's a great agent newsletter and I'm looking it up right now. Anyway, it's on Substack. I think it's right. Written by, I think it's called books and agents. Um, okay. Kate McKean, something like that. Um, anyway, uh, she, she, she kind of talks about agenting issues, um, every week. It's a good one. It's free. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Which is yeah. great. Um, yeah. let's see, uh, uh, poets and writers Chelsea also said poets and yeah. writers is a great website manuscript wish list. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have a panel soon, a symposium panel, um, with, agents. And then I'd love to have another panel with editors so we can like crawl into them. We did that with um, screenwriting and that they will be free. And we did that with screenwriting, with screenwriting manager and agent. And um, it's just great to get that, mm -hmm. you know, opportunity to ask them questions too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think we're good. We're good. I think we're good. That was and fun. You, it was longer than an hour, but we appreciate you hanging a little longer. We appreciate your dog holding his or her bladder. <laughs> yeah, he, he's sitting here right now, staring up at me. I think we 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 pushed, pushed him to it. the limit here. Pushed yeah, it. yeah. Please apologize to him for yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. Now he's my writing companion. He's on my lap every morning with my laptop on top of him. So, Aww. lap dog, laptop. Uh, yeah. yeah, we write we write together. Oh, that's so great. So um, our next symposium is going to be, um, let's see, with Jeff Willis, who works for Marvel. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be talking about business basics for creatives. And that's on the 11th of this month. And um, he does a lot of like contract negotiations and stuff like that. So, it, and he's super, super generous and kind and um incredibly knowledgeable. I did a very long interview of him, um, a short one for Writer's Digest print magazine, but one for that ended up getting published on scriptmag.com. Um, great guy, super generous. So we like to have those kinds of people who just love helping other writers. Um, but like thank you. you so much, Grant. And thank you. We really, really appreciate it. And if you need a judge for your show, I'd love to. Okay. I'd love to, or just watch. I want to just be there on set and just like watch because I'm like an American Idol freak. I love oh, that show. And it's, it's, I love watching people go after and achieve their dreams. Yeah, you know? it's a show based on positivity. We're not going right? to practice all the negativity that a lot of reality shows have. So Yeah, which yeah. is awesome. Okay. Yeah. You're gonna Everyone get do NaNoWriMo. Go to the NaNoWriMo site. Sign yes. up right now. Get ready to write. You can do it. I want to see you, you in NaNoWriMo. Yeah, And I'm going to sign up this year so you guys find me and we'll all create this whole little pipeline community and we'll um, cheer each other on and tweet out writing sprints and all that kind of stuff. Thank you so much, Grant, not just for being here for tonight, but for everything you do for writers. We really appreciate it. Right back at you. Thanks. We'll see you. Bye-bye.